three, two, one. By the way, oh, this is really good on. post credits roll if you want it. What in God's name is going on here? This is the White Nose Boy. The Revival. Devil is amongst us. Stay back, boy. This calls for divine intervention. Hey, everybody. This is the White Noise Boys for June 22nd, 2016. I'm your host, Chris Taylor, and with me is... Alexander. What have you been up to, Alexander? You got anything interesting going on this week? Um, so this week um, has been much of the same for, for my editorial role here on uh, the Madbox channel, the Madbox World. But the week coming up will be actually really interesting. I am going to be in Amsterdam uh, for some work. So I'm excited to uh, see the Waffle Country. Are you actually doing work? Because... As, uh, from what I've heard, Amsterdam, they uh, frown uh, on weed yes, tourism. Yes, they do. Uh, they frown on weed tourism. They are actually okay. capping how many people can come into the city on a daily basis. Uh, I stopped reading the article. I mean, you know, it was not that interesting. But I am going for work, uh, for training. It's a week-long okay. training, and I'll get to stay uh, through the uh, July 4th weekend. So I get to miss out on some barbecues here, but it should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So you're going out there for trading. Uh, what have I been doing this week? Uh, I had a round two interview with a place downtown. I will hear back on Monday um, in that awful waiting game where I like to plan for everything, but now it's just sitting here on my thumbs, waiting. Uh, started streaming again this week, which will come up when we talk about the games that I've been playing. I've been doing some horror streams, good stuff like that. Uh, the other thing I've been up to is I have been learning Angular 2, but with Angular 2 comes uh, TypeScript, and Are you, do you know anything about TypeScript? Um, so I've, I've just started to read some about it. Um, I know essentially it's... Uh, a layer on top of JavaScript. It's a transcompiler uh, that essentially allows you to write JavaScript in a, in a cleaner, more uh, readable way that then can uh, transcompile whatever you write into, uh, you know, either the, the current version of JavaScript, the ECMAScript 5 or, or ECMAScript yeah, 6. Yeah. You want me to lay it on to you? Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask All you, right. uh, bring it on. So the, the JavaScript you normally write these days is. Uh, ECMAScript 5, that's just plain old JavaScript that everybody writes. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it, like it doesn't have a block level scope or anything yeah, like that's... that, right? So, and the way it handles this, as a, somebody coming from uh, languages like C Sharp, a language like C Sharp or Python, I really hate the way JavaScript handles this because this doesn't mean anything really in JavaScript. So you wind up every time you want to use this, you have to say var that equals this and then refer to this, that all the time. That way you know how things are going to work because you're seizing the local scope. And that kind of stuff really bugs me. But uh, so you have ECMAScript 5. And then you have ECMAScript 6, which is they've stopped calling that and they've started calling it uh, JavaScript 2016 or is it 2015? But uh, 2015. Yeah. Um, I remember correctly. most browsers support most of that. I'll find there's a, a chart. It's a, cause you know, you're familiar with, can I use.com? Of but course. There's a single chart that compiles all of the charts from, can I use for every feature of 2016 and gets updated daily. So every day you say this browser support, these browsers support these features from ES 2016. So you know what you can use without a transpiler. So the thing about that is all ECMAScript 5 is valid mm -hmm. ECMAScript 6, right? ECMAScript 6 is a superset of ES5. Now, TypeScript is a superset of ES6, right? So think of it like uh, Russian nesting dolls, where ES5 is in the middle, ES6 is on the outside, and Babel is outside of that. Babel is... Uh, 
it's like coffee script or type script in that it is ES6 but is pooling features from the ES7 specification and oh, so they've that, gone up to ES7 well there's proposed specs for it so they're pulling in features that have been agreed upon from the proposed spec interesting so even even though it's not done it's more future looking right and then what you have to do is to transpile you can hook that up into your gulp build so because like i'm sure you're using gulp now have i gotten uh, your gulp yet? yeah so you've uh, you've told me about gulp and but yeah it, it, you can automate your transpiling as part of your build process so typescript is like Babel in that it is ES6 pulling features from ES7, but where it varies is that you have the option for declaring type parameters for a function. So like in JavaScript, I could write the function add that takes in A and B and then have like really course, bad right. runtime errors when I accidentally pass strings into it, right? But if I, I can specify in TypeScript, I can say this needs to be a float or some other, or like a, it, since ES6 supports it, it supports stuff like a bitwise and stuff like that. But I could just say, I did see that and I, I like that a lot. vague about um, my types as saying this needs to be a number. Uh, and then when I try to, when I, tr when I try to transpile, it'll be like in C sharp, I'll get a compiler error and for really large projects, that's awesome because what winds up happening is you don't have production errors in production that you don't find until you, a million users start banging on your application. You catch them at the compiler level and they never make it into production code. So, so, so that allows you to fix all you know issues, yeah, base, basic coding issues that you might have run into. And um, you can have all these awesome features. Yeah. Yeah, you can have all the awesome features of ES6 in it uh, because it, like Babel, will transpile down to plain ES5. So so I, I read some, uh, you know, views on that on, on the internet. Of course, everyone has a valid and a great opinion on the internet. And uh, some of the folks that were anti uh, this change in, in a more, you know, creating a more typed environment, a more... So let's mm -hmm. be real. Let's be... I want to be real really quick. When you said everyone has an equally valid opinion, that's not true. Uh, my father had this thing he said to me, and I have remembered it because it's true, and that its opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. Well, of course. And so, so that's what I meant by uh, <laughs> so that's what I meant by a valid opinion. Uh, it's valid in that it simply exists. It's not necessarily <laughs> correct or true or should even be given any merit um <laughs> so, so that's what i meant by a, a valid opinion uh you know but but it was really interesting the the sort of you know the arguments i was reading from from people that just simply didn't come from the structure of a, of a more object-oriented language like uh you know c sharp or java um and, and really kind of thrived on on essentially writing shitty spaghetti code in javascript and you know, that's what JavaScript is good at, right? And and I can see their point. You know, they were probably scamming their customers by you know making something that works, and you know if it breaks once or breaks once it's or twice, or nobody else can manage it. You know, it justifies. You know, you, you and I both had some experience with with that, right? There was that one. So, so here's what I want to say: if you're that guy use TypeScript anyway, because all ES5, the JavaScript you're used to writing, is valid TypeScript. TypeScript adds features on top of that, so you can you don't have to learn the whole new thing right away. You can start slow, you can write your normal JavaScript spaghetti code, but then you can say, well, maybe I want real objects for this instead of just glorified dictionaries. Sure. And no, it, then, it makes, I mean, to me, it makes sense. It's almost a natural it, progression. Yeah. Um, then you'll get into a point where you'll say, oh, I need a, a an if-level variable here, so then you can use let, right? The uh, let keyword in ES6 is a way of having a variable, and since variables can hold functions, also a function that is restricted to... So if I have three nested ifs, and I have a let in the middle, 
that let variable is only accessible in the middle right. and on the inside. So it scopes in, but it's not available in the no, outward so, I mean, it scope, makes, so you don't it pollute makes perfect your sense. Just that one little addition. That one little addition is huge because the way you would normally have to handle that is to write an anonymous function inside of your if, and that way... Right. Because otherwise, the variables you create in your ifs are globals now, right? Unless you create an anonymous function, but then you're also exactly. adding um, compiler overhead so, because so it's, now it's I mean, got to remember this all function. Around, all around a big improvement. There are... Did you see the fat arrow stuff? There's yes. uh, actually real anonymous functions. Like, you've done some Java, you've done some C++, some C Sharp. You mm -hmm. know what a Lambda is, right? fat arrow functions where you have equals uh, greater than, those are lambdas now. JavaScript has lambdas in ES6. So you can actually have really, truly anonymous functions. And um, So for our audience, explain uh, explain lambdas just in, in a brief... Um, <sighs> right, we, we can't expect everyone to be... Yeah, so or, or have experience let's, say, let's say I have a for each, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And... I need to do, I want to for each through all of the things in this dictionary that start with the letter okay. A. Normally, I would need to for each through the whole thing and check the first character of each entry and then have an if statement that I evaluate on every iteration, right? But now I could just say for each because you say for each X in y do z right so now my x can be for each uh entry and then have an equal sign a greater than and then say uh and then have a little functional expression where i can say data source dot uh subset and pull out a subset use some sort of uh use some sort of list expression to pull a sublist. So now I'm only iterating through the sublist. So for each thing in this, it lets me where you would normally need to pass in a variable, you can pass in a small function and the output of that function is what you're actually passing in. So anywhere you need a variable, but you want something a little more complicated and you don't want to have to prep your variable every time or have an if statement, you can use an anonymous expression for that. See that you too know sounds the most dope thing is, so and helpful. Will be good for you at work. In, in moving is uh, generators. Do you know what a generator is? Uh, it, it it generates. You can you, no energy. So in I don't know <laughs> what, what is a generator. So in what's the, the uh, problem? If I have a list that contains a million items, what's the problem with trying to for each through that list? The time it would take to to get you know the overhead required to. Where does that list. where does that overhead come from? It the overhead uh, comes from the fact that you're holding the entire list in memory at once. Yeah, so you're just bogging down your your machine. So I can write a generator that does some function does something to uh does something to an item, right? And you, you call it using yield, right? So I could attach a generator to do all of the stuff I would write in my for each and then apply that generator to those million items. And instead of slurping the entire list in, it remembers what position it was in last time and pulls the next one. So you can iterate through a million items, but do it one at a time. So your data set can be infinitely large and the generator That's will be as, as performant so, as it so always is every time. So instead of keeping the, entire, the entirety of the list that, in memory, so, it just keeps the position from the last time it went through it. Right. That's why, since JavaScript didn't have generators, that's why a lot of Google stuff is written in server-side Python, because Python was one of the few languages that had true generators for a while. I think uh, C Sharp has them now as of .NET 5.0, uh, and now JavaScript's getting them in ES6. But that's why Python was really popular for data science for a while, because it had generators. Then people built all of the other libraries on top of that. And that's why when you hear Python, somebody does Python, you know they're a data scientist. Or they're a, a full stack in a place that uses Django. But generally speaking, Python was the language of data science for a long time because it had generators like that. And they were easy to write and easy to use. 
and uh, ES6 has those. There's a lot of other great stuff with ES6, like uh, I'll go over one more feature just because I want to get moving. We're a little over our intro segment, but the uh, right. you know when you want to have a parameter with a default value in JavaScript in a function, what you have to do is you have to say right. It's not have a the parameter solution. X in my declaration, and then in my first line is X equals X or something else, right? And that works out until the value of x is falsy, and then the yeah. Whole so thing you're, breaks. you're essentially error checking every so single time. So now, that just like preventing error. C sharp in the function declaration, I can say x equals four, and then I if when I call that function and it doesn't have an x, it'll just use four instead. Well. N yeah, you're preventing more errors, and it also, it's like in C-sharp, you're getting overloads without having to write them. Because I could call that function, if that function takes an x and y, I could call it with 1 and 2, or I could just call it saying y equals 2, not give it an x, and it'll automatically assume whatever. Right, right. So, because in JavaScript, you have to manually write, if you're writing a really big code base, you have to manually write a bunch of signatures because of that falsy problem. Yeah, so, so point of... ES6 then simply it will improve the language and and make it into something usable. It makes it like a real language. Like right now this is very opinionated of me, but JavaScript is the language I think of when I think of script kitties because everything is like held together with glue and duct tape and barely works in ES5. You know, I mean to to defend that I guess since you know for for me I've always been put off by the the what I today know to be the minified files of JavaScript, because whenever I, I looked at it, it just, you know, it wasn't readable. I didn't know where to start. You know, everything looked so foreign, and so well, it wasn't. Your Chrome Dev Tools have us now have an option to uh, prettify JavaScript files. So even if you're looking at a minified one, you can click it, and pff, there's the real JavaScript. Right. No. No. But this was, you know, this was years ago when I when I first considered. Uh, you know the beauty of of co coding. I just JavaScript you know, had got no idea about. too big, too fast. So it's like the banking system. It's too big to fail. Oh my god. Well, JavaScript is definitely too big to fail because JavaScript is not just a front end language. JavaScript is a server side language now. Also, like JavaScript is consuming the entirety of the internet, which is why it's so weird to me that that happened before JavaScript got like a lot of the features you would expect from a robust well, widely I think, used I think language. it's it's sort of like everything else in the world today, you know, you something that that the thing that JavaScript powers blew up. You, I'm sorry. When you said in the world today, I immediately thought of uh, the Wu-Tang song, <laughs> you be here in the shit that the JavaScript say. Oh my god. I love <laughs> Wu-Tang. Uh but but just to finish what I was going to say, I think just with the with the users, you know, computer users, and and how fast all of that blew uh -huh. up throughout the '90s and early 2000s, and today with the, you know, with the devices and mobile phones, I think it just the demand was growing so much faster than than the supply of, of a good language. So it's good that it's finally caught up. And I did want to ask you for your opinion, yeah. um, since since you're good at those, uh, you know, educated ones. Yeah. But do you think JavaScript will indeed? One day be the only language that's used. Do you think it will? It, it, do you think it will ever get to a point where it can power the entirety of the internet? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, okay, the internet. No, because there will. be be applications that have so much going on in the initial load that it will cause timeouts in the browser and that's the advantage of PHP is all that stuff gets handled server side so your entire application's initial state is configured and it hits the browser ready to go. So essentially the issue is going to be that the user's devices just won't have the memory necessary. Uh, to load oh, right. On top of that, on top of that, JavaScript is really because JavaScript blocks rendering. If you have too much going on, your browser will treat it as a network timeout if you don't get to first render fast enough. Interesting. So, yeah. Hmm. On 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 top of that, you can never write anything 
very, very low level with JavaScript because JavaScript doesn't even compile. It's JIT compiled, so you can't write low level because you don't know how the browser will actually right. mm. write, read your code. Uh, on top of that, I think JavaScript will we will see JavaScript become less popular for server side, because not because it's bad for that, but because right now we're at that point where Node is flavor of the right. Month, everyone just wants people to are be using on the... Node for projects that should not be using Node, and we'll get to the point where that gets that community gets mature and robust enough that people know when they should use Node, when they should use Azure, when they should use JSP. We'll get there. What I really want is for browsers to get faster at iterating and supporting the new spec, because right now have it, you have to run, run a lot of modernizer tests for uh, to find out what ES6 features you can or cannot use. OK, so all we have to do is we have to wait for the elderly people to go to Disney World, fill up their computer with pictures from their camera, not know enough about computers to know how to make space, and then just buy a new computer, and bam, they'll have a new web browser. Or, the, or they'll die. That's the nice... You know what? I'm going to stop there. Okay. So so now, now, now that we're talking about extermination of the elderly i think it's time to move on so we're gonna t we're gonna do something new this week we're gonna take uh some listener questions we ran a little long on the intro longer than we normally would because uh we're we're trying to go with a shorter show format took some uh user questions so i'm gonna start with and you can take the next one at gamer guy in a suit asked everyone has that one game from some point in their life that really made an impact which one was yours and why i have an answer for this do you have an answer alexander uh i think your answer is better uh well yeah i'm gonna yeah. <laughs> inherently guess because uh I, I will go with uh um you know probably tony hawk pro skater the first one oh, um and, and I can get into that briefly. You know, looking back, it's it's not that interesting. Do it. All right. So 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 here it is. Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Well, do it um, anyway. You know that Just game came out in, in the early '90s, and around the time you know I was a, a a wee teen, and you know everyone around me was into skateboarding and such. And of course, being as I am, and if you look me up on the internet, this will make sense. But needless to say, I'm not a skateboarder. Uh, I, I would say I'm a I'm a swimmer that rounds anyways so you know i was at costco and i got profiled by an employee at costco because he was trying to talk to people about skateboarding he looked at me started to open his mouth and then closed his mouth and i got profiled as <laughs> that, that guy probably doesn't skateboard uh and you know what he well was right, so so that's that's the thing so so bad. being one of those kids you know uh like everyone around me was uh was into skateboarding you know bikes uh graffiti whatever but you know you're not going to see me climbing the walls to put up pieces on bricks or no but it was an it was an interesting entry point into that subsection of culture that you didn't right. know anything and, about right and so here's how it all tied for me on the gamer side right uh, cuz i've always played games but i would say this is where i kind of uh, got into the gaming culture so basically i got so good at that game where um, i beat i beat like one of the regional records for uh, for points uh, and like it took me the entire summer, like I just remember, not caring about going outside, just six hour, sixteen hour days of playing the game, uh, and just getting so great at racking up points, um, you know. And at that point, I was I was looking at the internet and, and seeing what the points were, and I got to like a billion or something like that, um, which I thought was really insane. And you know, then I looked up at the actual records here in this country, and uh, needless to say, moved on with my life. But but yeah, so. It, you know, it had an impact on my life in a way that I just burnt so much of it playing the game, trying to achieve a, a sort of a meaningless goal of, you know, ranking in the world and being the... In I would argue that every goal you could have in your life is meaningless. Oh, because absolutely. One day and I would and not, none of it will I would matter. argue for that same thing. I wouldn't really have... Because, yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, none of this shit matters. Happy yeah. Happy <laughs> So, so Chris, t tell tell us about your uh, one game and the impact it had. I have two, 
and they both are games that have a lot to do with philosophy. One is shorter. Spoiler warning. For the next four minutes and roughly four seconds, Chris talks about the game Soma, a game that um, I, I should probably look up when it came out. But uh, for the next four minutes, he'll be talking about the game, the ending, uh, and the philosophical uh, points of it. So if you've played the game or do not care for the spoiler, like myself, uh, you know, spoils can't spoil me, don't hesitate to listen for his take on the game. Otherwise, please skip ahead. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying this. And if you are, plug alert, subscribe. Thanks so much. All right. The first, So I'll start with that one. The first one is uh, Soma. Uh, have you played Soma? No, but I wanted to. Um, oh, it's really good. It's uh, the newer game from the people who did Amnesia and the Penumbra hmm. games. It's their first person sci-fi horror game. Uh, it's less of a horror game and more of a philosophy game. So... The thing that really got me is that this game ruined cyberpunk for me. Because I'm a guy who's really into cyberpunk. Yes, right? yeah. You, so you like when your you think cyber... about cyberpunk and you think about Ghost of the Shell, you think about like uploading yourself to like the internet and existing as a like a, a being made right. of data. I mean that's that is it is that a cyberpunker's uh, dream? Is that is that like your your life's achievement? That's that's like a that's like very that's a very standard cyberpunk thing. I, I so here I don't want it anymore because this game ruined it for me. So here's the thing to think about: when you upload yourself, you are not transferring you right. because you still exist in your body, right? So you're creating a copy of you. Can that so copy of you then develop itself in its own ways? So here's the question. Which one of those is you? Uh, and the way the way Soma handles that is the concept of a coin flip. You have a 50-50 shot of you, the way you think of yourself right now with all of your past life experiences, being the copy of you on the internet or being stuck in your body. That's really... Wow. I mean... And here's the other thing. I think it's also secretly terrifying for the other copy because they're suddenly birthed into existence relatively mature with no preconceived notions of having existed or how to live their life. Right. Uh, there's a lot of uh, – this, this could be a tangent, but and that's there's a lot of different interpretations on that in, in media and in and there's a uh, There's a group in Soma where they upload themselves and then immediately kill themselves – to kind of preserve right. continuity, so that there's not two of you. There's I mean, that's, one that's, continuous. It, in a way, you. that's the only way that you could do it for real. Because, sure. <sighs> do you want me to tell you the ending of this game? So, you're a, you spoilers. You're not a person. You're a person's consciousness uploaded into a robot, and you're at the very bottom of the ocean. And you, there's a, a like a, a computer running a simulation of the, uh, of like an idyllic world with the last, th with like 30 human consciousnesses in it. And you're going to launch it into space th from a railgun that runs from the floor of the ocean to the top of the ocean. And you're going to launch it into space using this railgun, right? And th as the thing starts to launch, you're trying to upload yourselves. Mm-hmm. In you and the person, the consciousness you've transferred into, like, your PDA that's hung out with you, and you succeed, you see it fly off, and then, you know what, you know what really fucked up stuff happens? You've used the last of the power on the base to launch it, you let something happen and your legs are broken, and then you and your PDA assistant are still sitting in the bottom of the ocean, the lights turn off. You lost the coin flip. There's a copy of you on this thing in space, but the you that you have been playing as is forever doomed to sit alone by yourself. No wow, one to that ever is talk morbid. to. You will live forever because you're a robot trapped wow. alone by yourself that's in the so dark morbid. at the bottom of the ocean because you lost the coin flip. It's really, it is really fucked up and the darkest ending to any video game I've ever played. And that right there, I don't want it anymore. Like, that ruined a large portion of things that I thought were cool about Cyberpunk for me. Because I'd never thought about it that far.
the morality the morality of future computing is really scary. Yeah. You should play that game. It's really good. <laughs> so, yeah, dude, it's... Yeah, so... S I recommend it. Soma sounds like a, a really morbid, out there worthwhile game to, to experience just for... Just, just for realizing what might happen. Yeah, that's. I argue, I would argue that it's not morbid, but it is a realistic depiction of the morality of those types of technology, and and one that we that might is we might have to consider in our in our world at some point. Right. Well, that's the only way the human race survives at that point. Yeah. So it that could come within could, our lifetimes. It's like the trolley problem, you know? So the other game I would think about this, and I think this game had a bigger impact on me, but there's less to say about it, would be okay. the Talos Principle. Uh, the Talos Principle is this really sedate first-person puzzle game. Thir oh, it's 3D. It's a first-person puzzle game, uh, except the game is also substantially almost all about philosophy. So you'll encounter a terminal, you'll read messages and hear audio logs, uh, and they'll engage it with a lot of philosophy of life, sentience, and robotics, because, spoilers, you are a robot in that game. But... So you'll read a bunch of that, and then you'll go do a bunch of puzzles while you're chewing over the philosophy in the back of your mind, and it's got a really good loop. But that game, so like I grew up in a religious household, but that never really applied, that never did anything for me. So when I was a kid, I thought that so I like to I think of myself as very truth oriented where if things are proven true they are true and if logic holds that rules the day and the talos principle was able to through its philosophy make me understand the value of religion and spirituality in a modern world and how it is not diametrically opposed to science and truth and I think that's really interesting because that's a thing that when I was going to church as a kid, no Christian could explain that to me. But this video game made by the people of Serious Sam did that. Oh my God! The it it made, made Serious the... Sam. That's great. Yeah, but so. Well, that actually like, is so fitting because you know, with the whole this game. Yeah. Truth. Well, this game. This game legitimately, I would say, has changed the permanently changed the way I view certain parts of the world and objectively made me a better person for it. I highly recommend the Talos Principle to everybody. We'll make sure to put that down in our notes, absolutely, for, for yep. those those listening and watching. Uh, the, so the album art on YouTube. We had a uh, we had another question. Uh, if you want to take this one, because this is kind of a shorty. Yeah. So our second question came from uh, another Twitter user on our uh, Twitter channel, Explosive Jacks, at Explosive Jacks on Twitter. He asked, uh, why did you start making YouTube videos? Who would you say influenced you uh, for that? And so for, for me, I, you know, having played video games my entire life and uh, after, after coming to this country and, and seeing you know, the, the full scope of what's possible with that, and especially, you know, after YouTube took off, and, um, you know, everyone's got a favorite YouTuber, you know, favorite series that you watch, maybe for games that you play, and, and so for me, I, I subconsciously was looking for a creative outlet with, you know, something that, that I did or, or spent <coughs> all my time on, and uh, I'm going to have to cut this out for a second. I thought my timer stopped. Uh, anyways, so so why I started creating YouTube videos, and, and simply it's for a creative outlet first. Uh, you know, because my 9 to 5 is not exciting. Let, let's not... Wh where, where does the creative outlet come in? Because, so for example, your biggest video series right now is playing Mountain Blade Warband. Right. So I could see that creativity coming through the editing, or because that game allows for creativity of play. So, or so it it's both. It's both. the full breadth of... The, the full... Um, scope of work that, that is involved in creating YouTube videos um, both from something that is a pastime, something that, that you know 
you could say I do for fun, um, into then the more tedious, more laborious things that come with creating YouTube content, the editing, um, coming up with intros, outros, you know, different quirky things to, to make my content stand out. So all of those things, for me, that's where that creativity comes in. I really, truly do enjoy it. Even that if bums it... me out that high quality content is not enough to make your content stand out. That's, right. I mean, that that's... bums me out about the internet. You know, it's so, so as far as an influencer, um, I'm, I'm oh going God, to, I'm, no, please. So, so, so I am going to call out the biggest one, PewDiePie. And the reason for that is because not because he's the biggest on YouTube, but also because he is. And in the way that he, he did, you know, he, he made that achievement. Of course, not to, you know, not to call him an, an Illuminati agent or anything like that. You know, who knows? But but what I like about him, you know, he started out as just some kid in college that played video games. Um, and if you look at his older videos, he was a COD squatter, which, you know, is a big noob no-no. Um, but, you know, it gets you it gets you wins. Anyways, but, but what I like about him is, is just the process that he had undergone to take something that he truly enjoyed doing uh, into a, an empire, right? Uh, into, one could argue, uh, uh, the most influencing thing on, on YouTube right now with, you know, 30-some-odd million subscribers to his channels. I mean, I... nobody even comes close. Like, the, st the second closest channel hasn't even broken 20, right? Um, that's, that's because he finally realized that the games he is playing is not the content, but what he brings to the table is the content. Right, and he's just like, silly, he he's just himself. YouTuber. And, and right. what's interesting, and that... gamer, oh, gamers don't really like him. Like, it's, it's the everyday, you know, kids that, you know, you don't know about. Like, kids in neighborhoods <sighs> so that just have... Older people do also. I know some older people who would not play... A video game but are interested in that and that's because they don't have to play it they don't have to wrestle with the controls but the way he reacts he gets them to understand what's good about it and also i would say that there is a talent involved in being able to continually improv comedy for hours have it be good like that's like Regardless, I don't I don't personally like the product, but it is a hard to make and a product that requires talent and hats off to you, brother. Yeah, yeah. So so hopefully one day, you know, um and I'm not even seeking that really. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of YouTubers, quote unquote, um, that you know, have a few hundred thousand followers or, or subscribers, you know, maybe a million and you know, not not to, to take away from the achievement of that, but I think it's very doable, and I want to give it a shot, you know, in the world today, if you, if you don't take on your own hustle, you know, um, so, so, to, to basically finish this, this influence question, it, it's just, you know, life influences me, no, I'm just kidding, so anyways, Chris, Chris, what, what is your, what is your take on this whole YouTuber content creation. Uh, so I was always doing horror streams. Plug, plug, plug. It'll be at the end. But uh, <laughs> I was always doing. I was doing horror streams anyway because I like. So I like. I like to play a lot of horror games and the idea of having a daily stream. Uh, if I don't have the the stream schedule creates a social contract which provides me with an excuse to do the thing I enjoy instead of just playing like Hearthstone or the Witcher or whatever, right? I get to like go and play this. You know, I have to add to that. That's kind of the, the same thing for me. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's an excuse to play some right. video games. Like I was going to play video games anyway, so but this is day. a good way to get into playing a game I would want to play. So I would say, so I don't do any video editing. Uh, I'm just giving you those videos and you can edit them. I guess the closest analogy I would have would be like uh, thinking about uh, entertainment products as actual products and thinking about end user experience and thinking about different shows and what format works, which is why this show is going to be a lot more compact. Like we're getting towards the end already, but like uh, with the new yeah. show that we're going to talk about later when we're doing the plugs, uh, a big influence for that for me has been like uh, everybody check out duckfeed.tv. Uh, they do the podcasts uh, 
watch out for fireballs, uh, bonfire side chat, abject suffering, monster in my pocket. They do a lot of good podcasts. Uh, if you're into Souls games, I recommend checking out bonfire side chat. But they're the biggest influences, and uh, one of the dudes from the network uh, did the bumpers for our new show. Yeah, so be on the lookout for that. It's, uh, I had a lot of fun cutting that into Did our... you play any video games this week, Alexander? Uh, I've been tremendously busy um, on the editing side, so I've not had a chance to really uh, indulge in my pastime. So no, I've not played Well, any. I played a couple... Uh briefly mention a couple of them all games i played this week i played for streams uh the big one being uh fatal frame 2 which i played about seven hours of this week uh it's a uh yeah that that's insane i watched some of those but yeah oh <laughs> fatal frame 2 is a, a p- mid ps2 era uh japanese horror game from uh project zero uh i, f- I love that game so you playing? Yeah. What do you What do you love about? This? There's a lot. So you play as uh, two twin sisters. <laughs> One of you gets separated. Uh, it's got a lot of fixed camera angles, like Resident Evil. Uh, mm. But it's a, a game about ghosts. Uh, I think ghosts are inherently are the thing that I think are scary, because realistically, given that I do not have perfect information about things that are spiritual. I have to fall into the I don't know category, which makes ghosts the most likely thing that could exist, and I think that inherently makes them scary for me. I'd have to to agree with that. Um, I've always had a... I I mean, I don't know if I want to call it an irrational fear of of that, um, but... You know, the rationality would be that the unknown, you just... I mean, right, like, you know, even even if you're not uh, sure about spirituality, I've never zero, died zombies are not likely out. to exist, vampires don't exist, but but given... I mean, well, so, so the thing about the vampires and things, and zombies, I mean, they're still within our realm, and it would just be, a, you know, like a cannibalistic, and, like, we know how to resolve that right. problem. You just, you know, get rid of them, burn them, or kill them or something, or ghosts, like, what do you... What so... Called Here's what's cool <laughs> about this game too is it has combat, but the way the combat works and the reason the game gets called Fatal Frame is you get this uh, camera and it's called the Camera Obscura, which is a, like a really good video game name for a camera, right? <laughs> yeah, that's but, pretty great. Uh, it like it's like the uh, like the Amish thing, right? When you take a picture of a, a ghost, you exercise a portion of their soul. AKA you do damage mm-hmm. to them, but because it's camera, you're looking through the viewfinder, first person zooming in. Your first person, you really can't move very much, and oh so my god, these ghosts are coming at you. You can't really move, move, and you're just staring directly into this really fucked up shit in the first person. It's really good, but then there's. Oh, I get that's a there's that's a genius, lot of timing, though. right? So the closer an enemy is to attacking you, the more damage a shot will do. And if you time it perfectly to where they're right about to hit you, like they're an inch from your face, their face is taking up your whole screen. They're leaning back to like attack you, and you'll get a little red flashing mm-hmm. light at the top of the viewfinder. You take a picture, and that's the fatal frame where you do the most damage, and that's where the name of the game comes from. It's really good, but it does a ton of damage knocks them backwards and then triggers if you wait half a second it triggers another fatal frame so you can combo shoot them to death and then there's like a scoring system where based on how good your timing how many dudes you hit with one picture if you've got fatal frames and combos you get points that you use to upgrade the camera so it's got an upgrade system on the camera it like here's where the camera thing is cool is that you can wow. you get special abilities, but you can pick one because it's tied to the lens of the camera. It's awesome. That's that's really amazing. That's so really genius. Good. And then the other thing I like about this is wow. it's. I think there's been two jump scares in seven hours, and the rest of it is very. It's very Asian horror. In that there's a, it's not necessarily continually jump scary, like something like uh, art, like Western horror. Western horror is gore based. Uh, there's slower bro- Japanese horror 
it tends to be more atmospheric dread, right? Yeah, it's more psychological. Well, Japanese horror is like just... psychologically influenced. So, like a good perfect example of like Japanese horror would be like a. Uh, the uh, original version of the grudge or where the concept of the place you go to every day and uh or silent hill that's psychological based right but right that's why i love silent hill oh my god fatal frame 2 Anyways. takes its horror influence from korean horror films and a lot of korean horror is about like for example here's a classic example have you ever seen the audition uh, no, I, I saw the trailer that's, for it. That's a real... <laughs> so a lot of Korean horror is... There's not not that much wrong. So in a lot of Fatal Frame 2, you're just going through, like, a village, and you occasionally see a ghost doing some stuff. It's There's not that much combat. But it's not scary so much as building up continual existential dread, and it does it through environment, audio, Fatal Frame 2 supports 5.1 surround sound even though it's a ps2 game and i have 5.1 headphones wow. and the audio is really good but it's also wow, they also amazing. use a lot of korean horror there's a lot of generating discomfort and like fear through camera angles a, a good example of a movie that did this really well is like it follows or we are still here but there's re- I, i've yet to watch it, it follows, follows as one of the best horror movies to come out in the last like 15 years. No questions asked. Oh my god. Like okay. as a horror super fan, top 10 top 10 horror movies, watch it twice. You'll know why once you see the movie the one time because you'll either be focusing on the characters or focusing entirely on the background, so you're missing half the movie. And that's because of the conceit of the movie. Check it out. Okay. But, wow. Amazing but yeah, as it's, well. It's Fatal Frame 2 is so good there's uh there is a dead chapter i spent about two hours running around the same environment waiting for stuff to happen because i have to find a key and the guy gave it to his sister and then his sister died horribly so i'm running around the house trying to find this ghost five times and it's because without that the game would be like eight hours long and this is back in an era where final fantasy 10 uh xeno saga and games like that were coming out and people were still thinking about value how much time does my dollar get me like these days your game can be four hours long and if it's really good four hours and never doesn't overstay its welcome that's your video game like call of duty campaigns right but this is back in a value era where they were not comfortable with the idea so there's a little bit of padding in chapter seven but other than that man dude this game holds up way better than i expect and i'm really glad because I would have called it one of my my favorite horror game and probably in a top five of my favorite video games, and it can probably stay there. I was worried it wouldn't hold up very well. It did okay. Yeah. Big ups. So you and it's, uh, it's great. you and Robo had played uh, another game, another one of your favorites. You've been trying to get me to uh, get in on Resident Evil Six. How did that go? Okay. I would not say Resident <laughs> Evil Six is a favorite. No. I think Resident Evil, Resident Evil 6 is uh, an okay game, a bad Resident Evil game. Probably really, te- it's really terrible if you play it single player. Uh, but we had a lot of fun. Yeah, didn't you? You were telling me at one point um, you uh, almost kind of felt like you were getting scammed into, uh, into fight. Was that the one? What, can you repeat that? You, had, you had said at one point that uh, you this was the last game you pre-ordered and you were so disappointed by it. Was that the one? That's the last video game I ever pre-ordered. Resident Evil 6. Don't pre-order video games. Uh, there's an episode of South Park where they say it the best. Uh, don't pre-order a video game because you, you it, they don't run out of video games anymore. You buy your video games on Steam. It's not like back in the day like when I had to pre-order Persona 4 because Atlas was only going to re- release 100,000 copies for the entirety of the U.S. And if I wanted to get it, I had to pre-order it now before the Weeaboos charged $200 right, for true, a copy true, on eBay, true. right? So you you had to pre-order back in the day, but now it's on Steam. They don't run out of digital video games. So these days, uh, there's an episode of South Park uh, where they say if you pre-order a game, all you get is a dick in your mouth, and that's basically <laughs> it. You're giving GameStop a loan, and you're paying them to finish the video game where they fuck off. Oh my so god, that's, that's, wow. Well put, South Park. You're not, 
and it, you know what? Collector's editions, do you really need more crap tchotchkes on yeah, your desk? Yeah, true. I mean... Come on. Just just buy the video game when it comes out. Even better, wait a couple of days when it comes out. Don't fall prey to fear of missing out. Because wait to find out. Find a reviewer whose opinions you trust and find out if the game is good. That's Unless you want to be a reviewer, order. then. Well, yeah. <laughs> you're probably not. Unless you're getting the game from for free from from the publisher, <sighs> so your opinion doesn't matter. Resident Evil Six co-op third person, uh, uh, horror name horror game in name. Don't only. pre-order it. Uh, don't even play it. Uh, we had a don't don't pre don't pre-order Resident Evil Six, mostly because the person trying to pre-order re Six for you is <laughs> been out for a couple of years. <laughs> But they were, we were uh, playing some, and there was a setting called attack reaction, and we weren't sure what it did. Uh, turns out, all it does is make the game way harder, but also more hilarious, because you and your partner can melee each other and knock each other to the ground, or you can shoot each other and knock each other over. You don't take damage, it just makes it way harder to play. So it led into a lot of hilarity of, like, Robo accidentally kicking me into an oncoming subway train, and it took us, like, 30 minutes to get past this 20-second sequence in a subway because oh we kept getting hit by trains. I see, I see that as really a lot good. of fun. I'm going like, to watch that. The... Th the thing I was, the scariest part of that game is once you get past that, you come up behind a subway car, and then the lights turn on. I was like, oh god, it's going to run us over. The subway <laughs> train was the scariest thing. But, yeah, it it's a lot of fun. It's not necessarily amazing, but we're having a good time. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's not that don't much to say it. about it. It's kind of, it's kind of bad. But I like it. It was on it, if if the game is still on sale, it probably won't be. But it was uh, on sale for like eight bucks for the game and all the DLC on Steam. So pick it up. Eight shekels. You can afford it. It's pretty good. Don't don't buy it unless you know someone else who already has it and you're gonna play with them. Don't play it by yourself because it's forty hours of oh, almost yeah. bad gameplay. Uh, the the only other game I played, and this is gonna be our last game, and we're gonna transition into plugs. Is we were yeah, just that was uh, our first our first episode of the goodening and it, it was really good it was really good i enjoyed it <laughs> we uh we were playing uh we were playing a rogue deck that i found on the competitive hearthstone subreddit and it's like a miracle rogue deck that was also a reno deck so you have 30 single cards except for two deadly poisons because deadly poison is just so good at controlling the board early game you need it really bad because this is a slow deck but then it's also an azoth death rattle deck it was the probably the single hardest deck to play that i've ever played like harder than freeze mage in my opinion because freeze mage you have one goal right and you you live till the end of the game and you kill them with spells and alex Straza. but Man, there were like five different things we could do every turn, and only one of them was the right option. Uh, I like the deck. We went. Yeah, uh, it was we it was um, one. great set of uh, set of matchups. I think uh, there's there's that one game where we played. Design, yeah. Oh my like, god. That was <laughs> that was a bit insane. Um, <laughs> and then the the opponent finally ran out of resources. We were low on health. And I'm like, yo, dog, after these three Nazoths and I still have a hand, you got nothing. Check out this Rito. Because, son, it was great. we're going to be rich. Uh, one, thing, one thing, so Reno <laughs> is, is the card, right, that heals you if you have only one of every card in your, in your deck. Is that right? So how does that, yes. how does that work with the so two for him um, deadly poisons? If I don't draw one of the deadly poisons before I play Reno, it doesn't heal me. I just play him, and it's a six mana four six. Oh, so you, so so if you play, so it. No, I don't have to play it. I just have to have one in my hand. It's I cannot have a duplicate of a card that's in my deck. Oh. I can't have two of a card in my deck. Every so. So that's why if I if I find a deadly poison in my opening hand, I keep it because then my deck is there's no duplicates in any of my card of the, any of the cards in my deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Works. Okay. It used to be a lot. <laughs> it used to be a lot harder to play a Reno deck because uh, they didn't have so like with if you've played a dragon card before, it says if you're holding a dragon, the card is green if you're not holding one, and it's yellow if you're meeting the condition. And Reno, you used to have to basically be using a deck tracker. Or, 
counting your cards to uh, know if he would work, but now they added the yellow outline so you know if Reno's going to work or not. That's really helpful. Um, uh, the reason they weren't doing that have. before is because the way this... Because Hearthstone is all server-based, right? That's where right. I can turn on my phone in the middle of the game. It'll disconnect me from the game on my computer and then load it there. But if they had done Reno without recoding the game, they would basically be DDoSing their own server because every turn, it would... For it would pull for every person running Reno every turn it would run up, and check your deck on the server every turn. So they would basically be DDoSing their own server. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh my God! Um, I can't imagine what that's like because everything, like nothing, is handled client side on your game. That's why you can't cheat. Like Hearthstone I mean, deck yeah, tracker so only works by reading the logs. Oh, fair. Oh, okay, okay. That's interesting. Every everything is server based can you imagine being like a, a deep uh like a, a devops or like a, a sysadmin for blizzard good god dude they probably get paid all right for the work that they do jokes on them they probably get paid 20 dollars an hour because it's a video game company and if you don't want to work for 20 dollars an hour get the hell out because we can find some idiot kid who just got out of college who will do it for less because they love video games yeah and because blizzard like you just say Hey kid, do you want to say you worked for Blizzard? Here's 15 bucks. Good luck. I have I have a lot of respect for people who make video games, because they're willing to get paid significantly less for doing the same thing as somebody else who gets paid maybe tw two or three times as much, and they do it just because they're that passionate about a thing. But I'm sorry, I could not be that passionate enough to deal with crunch and on top of a low pay. True, true. But you you did have your own gaming studio, which and, you know, I guess is probably different. Mm -hmm. Because I, if I don't want to work own. for three days, I don't work for three days. I just sit around with no pants on and play video games if that's yeah, what I want to no. do. That's the wonder of being self-employed. The problem with skipping a day of work when you're self-employed is in the next day you have two days of work to do and no one else to do it. Yeah, sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> I might put out one of those games in JavaScript using a TypeScript. Yeah, I, I gave that some thought. Um. My, might do the sphere jumper. Oh, so that's all we got for this podcast, right? Yeah, it's so, uh, it's plug time. I think it's safe to say plug time. We need we need we need music for plugs. It can just be the sound of stuff getting plugged into a switchboard. <laughs> so uh, let's see. For me, you can follow me on Twitter at the liquid sword d a l i q u i d s w o r d, and you can follow me on Twitch. Uh, I stream. Generally speaking, Mondays through Fridays, 7 to 9 PST, playing some horror games, we're playing Fatal Frame 2. When we wrap that up, I will either play The Evil Within on the super hard mode, where like it's one shot, one kill, oh for my God. me, or, or uh, I'm not, I'll play Haunting Ground or Rule of Rose. I haven't picked yet. I've played The Evil Within like seven times, and I love that video game, but... I haven't played either of these games, uh, Haunting Ground or Rule of Rose. I've heard a lot of good things about both. So I haven't picked, but we'll be streaming one of those next. Uh, you can find the videos of all... I also stream some random stuff occasionally. Like, I'll probably be getting into the uh, the Witcher 3 uh, Blood and... Uh, not Blood of Wine, Hearts of Stone expansion, and then going into uh, Blood and Wine, since I just finished up the main quest on uh, that. Uh, I am already over-leveled for the second piece of DLC and I haven't started the first one yet and I've oh done my God. didn't you plan not to get over leveled yes for that? it it just happened oh well I, uh, I'm excited for that since I don't know so, that I'll ever pick up the Witcher at this point but it, well it's either do you have up to like 70 it's the time hours. factor, right? Well, it's, it's 70 the, it's hours just, just to play through the story and the story of the DLCs. And if you're doing what I'm doing and you're doing Completionist, I played through it last year. And I played through it this year. And between those two playthroughs, I probably have like 300 hours played in The Witcher 3 already. And yeah, I still see, have to do the DLCs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, you know, I'll just watch your videos. How about that? But, but yeah, those streams, uh, given that I'm super overpowered, uh, th they should basically just be the story, and that's it. Because I've done almost all of the other side stuff. <laughs> like, I've well, done all of the map exploring, like, I've explored all the ma new map locations for Hearts of Stone, so it'll just be the story quests and the side quests in that game. So if you want to check out, hey, what's the story like in these things, and I heard it's amazing, I'm looking forward to it, 
check it out. Uh, so videos of my uh, videos of our Hearthstone stream that we're going to try to do every week uh, for about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, all my horror stuff, which is just all going to be under like the new flesh. Uh, for those of you who have seen Videodrome, check it out. If you haven't seen Videodrome, check it out. Really good. Greatest video. series name of all time, The New Flesh. Video games are dead. Long live the new flesh. Uh, and uh, and the goodening and that stuff. All that stuff. You could find uh, the videos on the Madbox Entertainment, which Alexander will plug, plug, plug. Yes, the Madbox Entertainment um, currently on YouTube at the Madbox channel. Um, give, give the URL. Do you have a good URL? Uh, not yet. So the funny thing it, is you have to have... URL. You can't. Uh, YouTube changed its uh, its rules about that. They have to offer it to you, uh, which you need 100 subscribers for. So the most important plug, we're at 43. Get us to the 100 subscribers so we can get a URL. Uh, but we're also on Twitch at the Mapbox World. Uh, I'm on Twitch at the Lord Petrie. Uh, Lord Petrie. No, duh. I don't really tweet on that, so it doesn't matter. Um, Follow me on Twitter. And... I tweet out of context jokes. Yeah, my, mo he, uh, my most recent tweet was just <laughs> Charlie's angles. Oh, I did have a tweet last week where I said, uh, "Vaping is the limp biscuit of breathing." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and that was very popular for some reason. Oh, that's really funny. Oh my god, vaping. Oh man. Uh, well, so so the most important thing for me, um, this this week will be more editing. Uh, I want to bring back Griselda and the uh, Griselda's barony in the land of Caldria um, in preparation for uh, Mountain Blade 2 that's coming out. If, if that actually ends up coming out. Um, I, might, I might argue you should just stop playing Mountain Blade 1 so that way you don't get burnt out on it because Mountain Blade 2 will be more of the same just with more stuff to do and you don't want to get burnt out. I mean, I I won't. It's it's been almost a month since I've played it. I probably oh. just played it in a more more control. So uh, you know, so I'm not gonna burn like 20 hours. Uh, important a day stuff. In it. Subscribe us on YouTube. Yes. Uh, uh, you subscribe to this, this podcast. podcast. You can find this podcast on iTunes. Subscribe and review it. If if you and rate and review the podcast on iTunes, we get bumped up on the charts. More people can find us. More people can learn about ECMAScript. Uh, those poor those poor suckers learning about JavaScript. Uh, and we have a new show coming out. Uh, when are we going to start releasing? Probably July 1st? Uh, yeah, so we had some discussion over that, but I think July 1st will just make well, the most sense. I said it on air, so now it's going to happen. It's July 1st. Starting on it's July sold. 1st. Is the feed already verified? Uh, the feed is not yet verified. It's only been 24 hours. Uh, I can take them up to three days. So uh, right, we're both ending up, on we'll, Google we'll Play have the first as episode. well. As. We'll have the first episode sometimes between now and then. So we have the feed active. You can subscribe to it, and we'll start releasing every day. Uh, the podcast is titled Magmar Sucks. Uh, every week we'll take a Pokemon. We will talk about that Pokemon, and then we will rank it in the list of all Pokemon that have come before from most to least interesting. And you can always listen to it here on the YouTube channel, uh, the Madbox channel. On but YouTube. tell your friends, subscribe, listen to episode zero when the feed gets verified. Tell all your friends about Magmar Sucks. That show is my baby. It's about five to seven minutes long. Comes out every day. Uh, if you want to know which Pokemon did 9-11 and why Magmar is so terrible and why Magnemite is the greatest thing to have ever existed, that show, that show's for you. And yeah. I think that's all for us, right? That's it. All right, yeah. Uh, this has been the White Noise Boys. Uh, feel free to stay tuned for some audio. That is me monologuing about the ethics of quantum computing as it relates to Costco. It's going to be great. For now, uh, White Noise Boys, signing off. Thanks, Grandma. What the fuck was that? the morality of quantum computing in Costco. So, so here's a good example of the morality of quantum computing, right? If I turn on a quantum computer and I have a quantum computer try to decide how to best save someone's life, what that quantum computer is doing is it's running millions of other simulations and in a lot of them, it is forcing that person to undergo extreme suffering 
that way it knows how to best help them it needs to understand what will hurt them the best so by turning on a quantum computer to better one person in this reality i'm inflicting suffering on countless people and countless other realities is it moral to turn on that computer I would say no. I would say no. The way I try to live my life is when I make a decision, I think about would I want to live in a world where everybody makes the same decision that I'm about to make? Which is why I try to follow the rules of the road in Costco. <laughs> I'm serious. The, Costco would be a better place if everybody followed the rules of the road. Instead, it's fucking anarchy. <laughs> you know what? I hope so. One, I wanna, I wanna live in that world. By the way, not necessarily because th there that's 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 a very well that's a limited way of thinking about it because every binary choice creates alternate worlds so yes we are ruining one perfect world but think about how many worlds are created out of everybody at that costco at that time based on every decision they make our decision is ruining a very 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 tiny fraction of those but is helping substantially more due to due to how exponential math works